What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kofinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and to learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guests in this week's episode are Sagar and Jetty and Marshall Kozlov, the co-hosts of The Realignment, an absolutely phenomenal podcast that consistently produces some of the best conversations at the intersection of politics and society that you will find anywhere. Sagar and Marshall are both successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders in their own rights. Sagar interviewed former President Donald Trump four separate times in his capacity as Chief White House Correspondent for The Daily Caller, and currently co-hosts the immensely popular Breaking Points with Crystal Ball. And Marshall is an executive producer at On Deck, where he also hosts The Deep End, a podcast where he interviews visionary builders, creators, and experts with world-changing ideas related to the future of commerce, higher education, art, governance, longevity, you name it. I asked them both to come on the podcast today because despite my best efforts over many years speaking with experts in politics, media, policy, tech, markets, etc., I am still struggling to fully grasp what I think is really going on here. And by here, I mean our ongoing political dysfunction, the public mistrust of institutions, and increasingly a strain of paranoia among the public that I think speaks to a deeper existential angst in the body politic than is commonly understood. We spent the first hour of our conversation discussing how we got here, why the so-called political experts whose job it is to explain what's happening have consistently failed to do so, what the new political consensus is that's forming in American life, and what it is that the majority of Americans want. What, in other words, would constitute a popular platform on which to not only run a successful campaign, but from which to lead a successful term in office? Or are these two things fundamentally incompatible in today's pseudo-celebrity-driven, fake-it-till-you-make-it culture that seems to reward the aesthetics of power over power itself? In the second hour, we focus our discussion on what I propose is a multi-decade breakdown in belief systems, driven by a series of failures covered up by lies, succeeded by more failures, like the occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, the 2008 financial crisis and its culture of never-ending bailouts, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic and the confusing directives and open disregard by health authorities of legitimate public concerns around the vaccines, the risks associated with taking them, mandating who should take them, etc. And this opens the door to a conversation about the changing media landscape and the growing power of independent voices like Joe Rogan's to influence public opinion and force issues into the public square that would otherwise be deemed off limits by those in positions of public authority. If you want access to the second half of this conversation and are not yet a Hidden Forces premium subscriber, you can sign up right now by going directly to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Or if you're feeling adventurous, you can help us test out our brand new subscription feed available through Supercast that we officially plan to publicize at the very beginning of next month and which incorporates some long requested audience changes like offering the entire first and second hours as a single episode on the premium feed, transcripts of both the first and second hours, and what we're calling intelligence reports in place of the usual rundowns. Existing Patreon subscribers, as well as anyone else who signs up early to help us test the new platform this month, will be able to roll into the new subscription at the existing rate of $10 a month for audiophiles and $20 a month for super nerds. If you're interested, send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I'll make sure to hook you up with a special link so you can start listening today. And with all of that out of the way, please enjoy this extremely insightful, fun, and profoundly educational conversation with my guests, Sagar and Jetty and Marshall Kozlov. Sagar and Jetty and Marshall Kozlov, welcome to Hidden Forces. Hey, thanks for having us, man. Thanks. 
we kind of just spent a bunch of time trying to get it all ready. So uh, I was telling you guys that I'm a huge fan of your podcast. I can't quite remember when I first discovered it, but it's so complimentary to the kind of stuff that I do on Hidden Forces because it isn't a natural crossover audience. I mean, there are people, I'm sure, that would listen to this podcast as well, but you guys focus on a particular, I guess, subject, whatever you want to call it. It's the sociocultural, political parts of society, the kind of stuff that I find so interesting on Hidden Forces, but something that we don't focus on exclusively. And you guys do it, and you do it better than anybody else. So before we kind of start, for those who don't know either of you or The Realignment, which is the name of the podcast, I'd love to know a little bit about both of you. So maybe Marshall first, where did you grow up and how did you get into what you do today? Yeah. So really straightforward. I was born in Houston, Texas. As Sagar will tell you, I was only there for two days. I was actually adopted. That's why my name is Marshall Kozloff. You see, you hear my voice and you see my name. It doesn't really make any sense that I am black, but it's because I'm adopted. I was brought to Oregon, I'm raised in a Jewish family. I am Jewish. My parents worked in the climate change space. So I really grew up in this very suburban, blue America space love Oregon, but part of the problem of Oregon is there's not much to do politically, especially given how uncompetitive it is. So the first thing I did when I graduated from high school in 2010 was came out to DC to go to George Washington University, where I actually met Sagar on the first day of orientation, which is a good pivot to his introduction. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a funny story. I grew up in College Station, Texas. It's a very interesting, kind of an odd place. My parents were professors at Texas A&M. And I grew up and really became politically awake personally because of the Iraq war. Mm. I grew up in a place that was like hyper pro Bush. George W. Bush was literally our governor. George H. W. Bush's presidential library was in our town quite literally. And it was a hyper partisan environment. I've kind of always naturally been a rebel. And I just was one of those people who would poke and prod and ask some very inappropriate questions of the very conservative teachers. But like, that's kind of where it came from a little bit. And then, yeah, I came to DC when I was 18 years old, met Marshall. Kind of the way that you get into this is by drawing on your experiences, kind of where you're from, then reassessing, like once you get to Washington, that was a big experience. I, you know, for me personally, being on Capitol Hill, like as an intern and just being like, what the hell is this? You know, it's like you, you have a vision of what it's supposed to look like from the West Wing and you do it and you're like, this is terrible. It's so mundane. You know, it's like so fake and all of that. And you get disillusioned. There's like cycles through which that this all happens. So any, for any young person out there who's like, how do you do it? I don't really have a perfect answer. I think really what it is is that just reassess, try and observe around where you are, think about how the world is right now, not as you would like it to be, try to drop some of your preconceived notions, just learn as much as you can about what's going on around you. Yeah, I, I want to add two quick things to this, which is one, my favorite fun fact story of all time, people get a kick out of. The key detail that I left out when I said that Sagar and I met on orientation day was that we got connected to by a friend, um, oh, a right. mutual friend from high school. And Sagar, and this is really early 2010 stuff, Sagar repeatedly messaged me on Facebook and I totally just ignored him because I was very checked out. Nothing personal, Sagar. I just was totally checked no, out. Was fine. He I was know. like, hey man, we know this friend. I didn't friend. know anybody else. Let's, so uh, like let's, let's hang out. No reply. On the first day of orientation, we're in line to just get checked in. And this dude just goes, are you Marshall? So the thing that's crazy here, especially now that we're not just like best friends, we've actually built a media company together is if I'd gone to a different orientation, if I'd waited five minutes on the elevator, we would actually have none of that. So it, it really is this weird story. But then I think a key thing too that is important here, and, we're, and we'll get into this, which is we came to DC in 2010, which was basically from my perspective, the height of conventional wisdom politics. Oh yeah. Right. Obama is president. The Iraq war was bad. Stephen Colbert is still funny. Jon Stewart is still relevant. There's always like very specific things that were happening. Mm. And when Sagar referenced getting disillusioned, this isn't just a typical just dunk on Obama. It's those real 2009 to 2014 years were really dispiriting in the sense of you just realize like, wait a second, authority doesn't really know what it's talking about. 
a lot of institutions that are supposed to tell you the way the world works. So I'm someone who did speech and debate. So I grew up reading Time and Newsweek for fun. Discovering during that period that those sources, through no ill will, just actually could not comprehend the world the way they were supposed to, that pretty much, I think, in both of our cases in different ways set us on the path we are today. What do you think that you guys also mentioned a lot of other things, 9-11, Sagar, also, I think it was either Marshall or Sagar that said, how do you do it? Maybe it was you, Sagar. How do you do yeah. it? Loaded question. Interesting one to explore if you have an opportunity. But just to focus in on that right there, what was it do you think that was going on during that period of time? Because I was in DC as well between 2011 and 2013. So what was it that was going on during the time? What was going on in the culture that you feel created that sense? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating because I came right in 2010, right before, I remember it was August 2010, two months before the Tea Party wave, there was a Glenn Beck rally. It was totally crazy. And when you think through, as Marshall was saying in that time, it was one of those moments where, you know, I was young and I hated the Iraq war. So I just supported Obama like everybody else. Mm. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And then Obama, you know, comes in, he goes for Obamacare and just gets totally destroyed. And then all you really have are these like right narrative from Glenn Beck and them. It's like some remaking of the libertarian dream on the one side and Obama, you know, all of that. On the other, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, it was the very inklings and the rise of some of the identity politics. And a lot of people don't know this. I didn't care about domestic politics almost at all at that time because I was like, you know, screw this. At that time, and again, it's it's difficult to remember, the debates, the most dynamic debates in the kind of intellectual space were around what the hell should we do in Afghanistan? Should we pull out of Iraq or not? Libya. ISIS, surveillance like state, terrorism, even surveillance state, I would say is a bit more 2007. I'm talking like right in that. I mean, you know, a little bit in 2013 with Snowden, but the real like juice was in national security. That's my background. Marshall's too, in terms of like what drew us in. Trump is what changed everything. Trump is actually what changed. And it, for me personally, why it broke so much was that Whenever you do national security, you read a lot of people who have very well-established opinions and, and you kind of really get into it. And a lot of them would also talk about domestic politics as well. And as Trump was beginning to rise and rise and rise, you would look to the same people who you respected, at least if, you know, at one point, for a convenient answer. And they were not giving you an explanation as to why this was happening. Like they were not giving you a good explanation, like why Trump was happening. Basically, what you began to realize is that, as Marshall said, all of the people who are credentialed and are supposed to explain that the world way the world works to you, we're not doing a very good job. And I know this because I was looking to that. I was like, what the f is we're happening? Talking now I was 26, like, where this 2016, 2015? I'm talking more about 2015. Hmm. I'm talking like November 2015. She'd be like, what is this? Like, not a single person who I respect, who I used to read in the Atlantic or New York Times, whatever, can tell me what's happening. And that was just a very like red pilling experience for me personally to be like, wow, like a lot of the people whose job it is to explain what goes on in the country actually fundamentally does not understand that. Now, look, like I'm not going to say I haven't made a lot of mistakes, overinterpreted something or the other, but like that has been like my central guiding want for the last like, what, six years is just to be like, okay, like how do you explain this? Because the people in power are not explaining it to you very well. What's interesting here, and I'm glad you asked the question this way, Dimitri, is I'm realizing that a key part of Sagar and my frustration was politics at that point actually was binary. Yeah. It's obviously like very obvious to say like, oh, like screw the two-party system. We want alternatives. But back then, other than the Tea Party, which from my perspective was, was very lame and frankly, very, very, very bad faith in terms of opposition to the Obama administration, it was you were a Democrat or you were a Republican or you were disengaged. If you look at the way young people who look at politics have really operated post 2016, the number of options, it's so much different. So you've got the Yang gang, you've got the Tulsi stands, you've got the various types of populism, you have the actual podcasting space that's really developed and built out there. You've got the Chapo people, you've got Red Scare, you've got every single different type of ideology. There even are kind of aggressive, hyper online, centrist neoliberals, which agree or disagree with any of these projects, 
you don't have to look at politics today as a young person, even a middle-aged person, and think, wow, all I can do is either support Barack Obama or support Mitt Romney. In both of our cases, like we're not going to support Mitt Romney. Um, not particularly excited about Obama, but I guess if that's the binary, then I guess we're going to be bored in 2013. I think that explains most of our politics there. <laughs> so I think this is a good lead up to what got us interested in the realignment idea, which was waking up in 2016, and I'm sure we'll get into this more detail, and just seeing wow, there are all these new entrants and new forces, media, magazines, all these different bits. And realizing that was an option there, I think the two of us would have reacted far differently if we were in college from 2015 to 2019 than 2010 to 2014. There's just a total divergence in how people have basically operated there. Mm. Okay. So a lot of interesting strains of thought. The last one being, it sounds like the influence or the transformation of media and literally the mediums of communication that exist. Because when you guys came to college, it was still primarily blog-driven, a blog-driven yes. ecosystem. That's and then right. social media took over. I want to kind of this time go back to some of the earliest things that were said and, and identify the ones that I thought were most interesting and just throw some things out there and see where it takes us. One, Sagar, you mentioned, well, both of you maybe mentioned, or one of you, I can't remember now, mentioned John Stewart and Colbert. Very insightful, very interesting. It's easy to forget what a powerful voice John Stewart was during the time that he was around. And his, the wave of John Stewart really was driven by the pacifism, the anti-war mm -hmm. stance, because that really defined like our generation. You mentioned Glenn Beck. I remember also in 2009, maybe even 2008, Glenn Beck began to adopt a lot of the stuff that you did see on Alex Jones, a lot of the more sort of conspiratorial strain of thinking. Um, he had that sort of blackboard and he yeah, had the George, George Chalk, no, the whiteboard, the whiteboard, the whiteboard. Yeah. George <laughs> yeah. Soros, the octopus, a lot of weird references. And I think that strain of darkness and paranoia has persisted. I think it speaks to something real, and I think we're seeing it pop up again. And I'd love to talk about that because I think Trump pulled from that. The support for or interest in Donald Trump pulled from that darkness, that dark strain. So that's one thing I wanted to throw out there. In terms of like the fact that this was a binary political time, true, but it's important not to forget that Ron Paul really had a moment in yeah, 2008. Yeah, sure. Because for me, 9-11, you mentioned it early on, Sagar, the influence mm -hmm. of 9-11, it was for me also formative. I was a sophomore in college. When 9-11 happened, I lived in New York, right next to the towers. That was a formative political moment. The counterculture that came out of that was very progressive, informed by the war. Those were the thinkers I was following. The networks like you know Democracy Now! or shows like right. Bill Moyer's Journal. And then 2008 was for me a watershed moment because it it fundamentally, in ways that 9-11 didn't even do, eviscerated my understanding of the world. Not because mm. of the actual credit crisis, but because of the government response, the naked power that was revealed in that moment. And to bring back the component of media, this was a time when Zeitgeist, the movie, came out. YouTube was a powerful force. So there was a lot of change happening there, but it feels like one of the things that occurred after 2008, after that moment with Obama's election, I also voted for Barack Obama. There was this moment where I think a lot of us who voted for him wanted to embrace a positive vision of America, but somehow that didn't quite work out. And so we ended up in 2016. Again, you mentioned the Tea Party movement. Sarah Palin was also kind of an early oh, yeah. sort of manifestation yeah, of that. This didn't end up exactly aligning towards a question, so let me try and pull one out of it. What do you think happened? Because it's crazy now. Barack Obama was like 14 years ago or something? Yeah, yeah that's something, right. 13 years right. ago. Or yeah, 14 years ago. Yeah, right. It's it hard to right. believe. So what happened, I guess, between the election of Obama and then the election of Donald Trump? You were sort of, Sagar, saying you were trying to figure mm -hmm. out what it was that did this. What do you guys think happened here? A lot of people have discussed it, populism, middle America, NAFTA, the Iraq war. How do we understand what happened in 2016? Yeah, I thought about this question a lot. I'm glad you're asking me now because I would have given you a different answer like three years ago. I used to think, so post-2016, I would have told you it was 70% economic and 30% cultural. I now switch those. I think it was 30% economic 
and 70% cultural. So the economic story is very classic. Pretty much everybody knows at this point. WTO, you know, David Otter at MIT has shown that, you know, the trade shock has dramatically reduced population specifically within the Midwest. NAFTA, all of that. You can agree or disagree. It's obviously had massive population dislocation, all of that. But I think culture is still such a massively underrated part of it. And I think that the identitarian move within the institutional left, and this is almost separate of Barack Obama. This is what I want people to understand. Obama was downstream of this rather than upstream. So in a way, it shows that whatever this was, it was way bigger than Obama. The zeitgeist, you can call it campus, you can call it whatever, you decide. But something shifted in 2013, I want to say pre-Ferguson, when you began to see a lot of the current streams of identitarianism that were there. I think it culminated and topped out in terms of institutional policy with DACA. And once again, you can support DACA or not, but DACA and the traces of Trump, Trumpism, the Republican backlash, Dave Bratt beating, um, what was his name? The Eric Republican, Cantor. Eric Cantor. For people who don't remember, Dave Bratt was a Tea Party congressman, kind of, who was running specifically against Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader at the time, and beat him in a Republican primary, despite spending less money on his campaign than Eric Cantor spent just on stakes during his campaign on the issue of immigration alone and on support for comprehensive immigration mm. reform. So you put those two things together. And I remember, I, I said this recently on Realignment, you might you may remember it. I remember Hillary's announcement ad, I think it was 2014, something like that. And she had a gay couple kissing in the ad. And I remember being like, whoa, like that's a step. And I, once again, you feel how you like, but you know, I knew like where I come from, Texas, like how exactly that is going to be perceived. And just realizing and seeing how fast the cultural change was happening. And I think you on top of that have the economic story. It just made it so that it was the perfect condition for Donald Trump. And look, Trump almost won the election in 2020. I mean, the guy won 10 million more votes and he didn't do anything, you know, economically populist while he was president. That should tell you a lot about the power of culture, about the backlash towards the cultural left and more. And, you know, if you're out there and you believe a lot of those things, it's fine. But I just think as uh, Mark Izagire recently was on the Realignment podcast, said something, those people don't go away. You know, they have a vote in a democracy. So what I would say is that Obama's greatest strength as a politician in 2008 and 2012 was basically lying about the positions he actually held on a lot of these cultural mm. left positions. But that's probably a good thing. You know, people should try and play coalitional politics. And a lot of that has been left out of the current center left right now. And it's part of the reason why they are where they are. What's interesting here is when I try to explain to people what the realignment is, it really is Sagar and I getting the chance to interview folks and figure things out as we go. So what I'm about to say isn't perfectly formed, but it's just the general reflection that I've come to. So part one, and this is how our critique has gotten more sophisticated. The data point that I haven't heard a particularly compelling response to is the fact that almost everyone agrees if President Obama had been able to run again in 2016, he would have smashed Trump, not merely in the popular vote, but also just electorally. So when you look at the unsophisticated tale of the 2010s, where it's like, oh, like Obama was, and this isn't what you're saying, Sagar, but Obama was so bad that Tea Party came. Even after the Tea Party wave, Obama still convincingly beat Mitt Romney. So Obama as a character is genuinely fascinating because I think what we see a key story here of is since 1992, Bill Clinton, the better politician has won the presidential election. Bill Clinton is a better politician in terms of a, at a performance level than George W. H. W. Bush. George W. Bush is a better politician than Al Gore. Same goes for John Kerry versus Bush, Obama, McCain, Romney, Obama, and then Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. So just on that level, I think we need to do a better job, especially if you're on the populist right and left, of analyzing like individual political performance in these types of things. This is a severely undercounted thing. But then part two to that is, it seems clear 
when I'm describing successful political operation, the key story since even 1992 is these change elections. You've got a huge percentage of the country that just is not bought into either political party as an institution, is pretty amorphous or confusing with their views. So let's say almost certainly there's a voter who is incredibly socially conservative, but is, let's say, more economically liberal, just these increasing factions that don't fit into any party, which means they are consistently up for grabs and they swing between the two of them. So the politician who is more able to advocate as a change agent is going to pick them up, which leads to, once again, Trump beating Hillary Clinton. The key story there, and the last bit I'll add here, is what also fascinates me is just the real declining quality of politicians when it comes to their actual performance at a literal level in the sense of There's a reason why no Democrat has succeeded President Obama in terms of being leader of the party. And too many people just dunk on Joe Biden because obviously he's old, he's past his prime. But on a personal level, I still think when he's on a good day, he's still more talented at politics, quote unquote, in quotations, than any of the Democrats you see today. And Trump is still a more talented politician than any of his competitors. That's the underlying story here. I had all these liberal friends, I'm sure you had them too, Sagar, who say things like, why doesn't Paul Ryan just stand up and just beat Trump? Or why doesn't this never like, Trump or just beat no Trump? It's like, would vote for forget, yeah. Yeah, forget like- their policy positions. Forget all of that. They just are not likable people. They are not talented. They don't have interesting stories. They're not stars. And just realizing that is what fits into Sagar's point that over-focusing on economics and specific policy positions and more on affect and ability is to read the deal that, whoa, people are kind of ticked off right now. How do I perform? In that context, you know, Hillary Clinton, you're not going to be able to do that, regardless of whether her individual policy views are correct. Wow. So many more questions. So one, why is that? Why is it that there doesn't seem to be another candidate on the left or on the right that can supplant the existing sort of leaders. In the case of the Democrats, Joe Biden, and in the case of the Republicans, Donald Trump, who isn't really a natural Republican or a Democrat. It's not really clear what he is. Yeah, but what does that mean, Mm -hmm. right? I think that's the key. So then, perfect. Let me maybe focus that question. What is, to the name of your show, the realignment, what is that new coalition or consensus What are the labels that matter in American politics today? How are people thinking of themselves? Is that part of the problem also that we have these no longer or less relevant labels that we try to use to describe ourselves? And in so doing, we're limited in the language that we use to describe who we are. And so the American public, in a sense, is somewhat psychopolitically stunted in terms of figuring out who we are and where we align and with who we align. Yeah, that, no, that's exactly what it is, which is that the problem that we have is that the current crop of politicians came up in the time that Marshall is espousing of binary right and left. Trump is so old that he actually does remember it. And this goes to Biden, too, of dynamic coalitions in which voters change groups or they simply transcend that ability and just didn't care. But they're not moored from the current system. The problem with the Gen X politicians and you know the older millennials and more, I mean, look at Pete Buttigieg, right? And I actually think Buttigieg out of all of them probably has the most talent, but I still think he would absolutely lose presidential election against Trump. But what you can see is that he's followed, they all follow the same story. It's college, law school, you know, reserve service in the military, six month deployment to Iraq or Afghanistan. This is bipartisan, by the way. Tom Cotton did the exact same thing. Jeb um, Bush, on the Jr. Uh, George P. Jeb, Bush. George P. But they all did this. All, every single one of them. College, law school, military service, come out, run for local office or whatever. They didn't realize that the entire culture was changing, that the labels don't matter, that actually all people wanted were not anybody necessarily tied to the system, but somebody who either hated the system or, in Biden's case, was able to defend it in a way where people actually liked it, only those specific parts. So it's difficult to describe, but the more meta reason I would give you is that the institutions of today are not built to teach people the skills and the story that they need to actually succeed 
in politics. It's also not changing anytime soon. And it's why we have such a dearth on the bench in terms of what's waiting in the wings and why we're ruled by septuagenarians. It's really funny. There's so many things to respond to there. So number one, I would push back, not that either of you guys said this exactly, on the idea that labels don't matter. When people say that, they take it way too far. Sagar and I have this recurring, we have this fight with the audience about third parties. Everyone is just like, okay, guys, we don't like Dems. We don't like ours. It's time to launch a third party. We're like, no, no, like that literally doesn't work. And if you want to see an example of how Trump is a good politician, small p politician, it's that he didn't run in 2000 under the reform party banner. Instead, he said, hey, guess what? I could be a Democrat one day, I could be a Republican another day, I could be a Reform Party member, I could run as an independent. But that being said, during the Obama era, if you look at most of my policy positions, especially their affect, I'm center right to conservative. So guess what? I'm going to run as a Republican. But guess what? When I run as a Republican, everyone knows I'm not running to be local county alderman. I'm not a person who's going to go work at the RNC. I am just taking this label placing it on me, but I'm still in charge. He, he treats it like a t-shirt that you could take off and you could put on. Right now, I could be wearing a Nike swoosh. If I did that, that would be a statement about, especially in today's America, that's a whole other topic we may get into, but me wearing Nike on a podcast is actually a statement as opposed to wearing Adidas or as opposed to wearing a Black Rifle coffee shirt, whatever. So what people are going to discover over time, and this is painful for a lot of populists who want to start something new, is that once again, all political parties are are coalitions of people. I really hate when people say things like, oh, like the DNC, it's just a conspiracy. And oh, the RNC, they pull all the strings. It's like, no, like the RNC is just a coalition of the people who vote Republican. That's why Trump was able to take it over. Trump noticed that there's a disparity between how he saw the world and how the establishment and the GOP saw the world. So then what he did was he just took that thing over. The difference here with the Democratic Party is that for good or for ill, whether or not you like the Democratic Party or not, the Democratic Party as a whole is institutionally more responsive to the way its base actually feels. So when Sagar's bringing up the fact that, hey, like in 2014 or 2015, Hillary Clinton is having an ad with an LGBTQ couple kissing, guess what? Most Democrats actually agreed with that. By contrast, in 2014, the RNC was saying, hey, Republicans, we should legalize all the undocumented immigrants, or we should do all these different things. That was not a position that the Republican base actually agreed with. So I'm really talking to left populist people here who think this is all about the DNC pulling strings here, when it's actually the fact that it just turns out that most Democrats not because of big money, not because of Hillary Clinton, not because of any conspiracy, just actually are just kind of like center left and are kind of like socially liberal, even like woke if you want. And that's the way they feel about the world. So what we're really seeing here to get to the question you're asking is that we are in this dead zone of our politics where Gen X unfortunately, depending on your perspective, is stuck in this in-between period where the paths they used to use to get to power But not only the paths they used to get to power, but the paths that they actually learned how to wield power have been cut off. AKA, we're going to see a lot less lawyers in our political system going forward. I think, I think, I think if you're, if you're a Bill Clinton type, think about this. Bill Clinton, he leaves his Rhodes scholarship early. He spends three years at Yale Law School. He only practices law for like a year. He teaches at University of Arkansas Law School. Bill Clinton today, brilliant politician, is not wasting three years of his time in law school just so he could get a credential. So that's just a fascinating example. And the last real bit here, this is my tick. I keep saying last thing, no matter what podcast I'm on is the actual politicians like Joe Biden, to Sagar's point, Joe Biden is just so old that he does have this institutional memory in his bones of, hey, like I should talk at least during the election about the center. Can you imagine walking up to Joe Biden as a staffer in 2020 and saying, Joe Biden, this corner of left Twitter is super pissed at you. He just actually would not care. And that's an asset that served him really well. Yeah, it reminds me in a way of when Bob Dole ran for president in 1996, and he kept referring to himself as Bob Dole because he had been so used to campaigning on radio. Yeah. radio. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? There's an even more, I think, significant handicap for politicians today who grew up in a different era who don't understand social media. And you can appreciate that. It's ironic because Trump really is a, an alien of sorts. Even though he's so old, he's so 
good with social media, so good that they had to ban him from the platform. Can I tell you why I think that is? Mm. There's no difference in who he is when the cameras are off. Mm. I interviewed Trump four or five times. I spent two and a half hours with the guy on and off the record. He's exactly the same. That's what I always try to tell people. I'm meeting with a politician today who, from what I hear, I'm not going to say who they are, uh, from what I hear, is completely different off camera than on camera. And one of the things I wish I could say is people know, you know, people just know. The most powerful thing that Andrew Yang ever did during his campaign is when he was on the stage, he's like, what are we doing? We're answering clips and sound bites. We all have makeup on. This is fake. The thing about Trump was, is that despite the fact that he had makeup on, which he probably always did, you know, for his entire career, despite the fact that it was sound bites or whatever, he just took it over. He's like, no, 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 no. It's like that Rorschach thing from the movie. He's like, you're locked in here with me. He's like, this is the Trump show. Stop talking. He's like, oh, you're talking? I don't care. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk over you until I'm done. You know, excuse me, excuse me, all that stuff. Stay silent whenever he wants. It was like he was the center of gravity, and that's exactly what makes politicians successful. When you look at the people who are coming up today, they all are desperate to be famous. But the problem is, in most cases, is that they're just like this. You know, I was watching clips from that Buttigieg documentary, and I'm like, God, this guy is a miserable person. Because you can see that he has the camera, Right, he's ready to turn it on and all that. No human being can sustain it. And he's like having, you know, Dairy Queen or whatever with his husband. And he's just like sitting there sullen and silent. Like it's just clear that there are two different people. There's the guy off and there's the guy on. Where in today's age, in all media, by the way, the only people who get rewarded are those who are just exactly who they are in the age of social media. So that's why I would say, and also I think Biden does a very good job of this too. I don't think there is any difference between the Biden that you see on the camera and the Biden that you see off the camera. I want to add a quick thing because Dimitri, you weren't quite saying this, but I want to push, I, I just had a thought when you were saying good at social media. I think we all need to better interrogate what good at social media means. For example, look at all of the young people. I think that in vast, in most cases, I think Every millennial we see active in politics today, I'll make a prediction, their careers are going to either end in failure, disappointment, or just like utter lack of accomplishment. Because what's really interesting about this moment today is that you could say, hey, like AOC is like super good at social media. I think actually, Sagar, I like your metric for authenticity. Is there a difference between them on Instagram live and how they are in their personal life? I suspect with AOC, it's probably pretty similar. So she's got oh, that yeah. part down. That's why she's good at it. The problem though is, yeah, but that's not going to pass the Green New Deal. That isn't going to accomplish any single part of her actual objective. She almost certainly is never going to be president, given the nature how polarizing she's had to become in this real transition moment. I think she's incredibly talented, but at the end of the day, she is still most likely in this unfortunate lost generation where just the polarization and the incentives were just so hit that you're not going to be able to escape it and you're not going to be able to do what you would do if you were truly a subsuming personality, which is make it your own, as Sagar said about Trump, or just exist above things. So when we say people are good at social media, too many politicians, they get their high follower accounts, they get the engagement. But what I would push more if I were ever a total hack working for some politician is say, yeah, but is this accomplishing our goals? Are all these likes and retweets and all these Fox News hits, are they, are they actually hitting or having us pass legislation? And guess what? The awkward, terrible answer, as I'm saying this out loud, is yeah, most of them like just don't care. I had a tweet about this that did well a few weeks ago where it basically said, the interesting dynamic is that as we see more and more politicians realizing that, hey, actually, this is a quick route to getting a blue check. This gets me an audience. I could just become famous. The whole joke about DC is Hollywood for ugly people is actually becoming more and more and more true in the sense that actually going to DC, going on TV, building a social media following, being able to get a book deal based on that social media following, launching a podcast off that social media following, at that rate, like why would you be a Congress? If you're not driven by passing legislation, like why would you serve in Congress during a time of just like real, I mean, what are you, like replacement rate? Like for example, like if Madison Cawthorn 
left Congress tomorrow, would would there be any literal difference? No, there wouldn't no. be. So like, why wouldn't you just go on Instagram a lot and do your Fox News hits? So I think this is the awkward dilemma that most millennial politicians are going to get stuck in because they are basically just forced to, to sum up my AOC, AOC terms, she was forced into polarizing herself when the opportunity when you're talking about pushing aside labels and knowing it doesn't matter is knowing that like, wait a second, I should be able to step aside or I should say, Hey, Fox news. I know you want to turn me into this like liberal heebie jeebie thing. I'm just not interested in that man. I don't want to do that, but they can't do it because they came in just too early. And when Pete Buttigieg is at his best, when he's, for example, on Fox news, Pete Buttigieg is incredible on Fox news, but he's incredible because you see hints of him being like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just like a decent guy. Whoa, whoa. You heard that. Here's how it actually is. You see him not playing into the partisanship and most politicians just aren't going to get that opportunity. So the thing that kept coming up when you guys were talking, I mean, at first I was thinking about one of you guys mentioned, you know, Trump put on the Republican shirt and, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, and I just thought that, yeah, I mean, he's very much like a mercenary. And there is this sort of dynamic that exists in our society today, which is that the individual has become empowered. We see this in politics. We see this in sports as well. It's a broad phenomenon. Well, at the same time, there is this attempt by the state to somehow institute a level of control. But what's interesting is that with respect to this thing around social media, this is actually a question. Do you guys think that the same broken incentives models that are turning, let's say, conventional media to sort of reduce the quality of what they're putting out there because they're trying to get attention. And the way you get attention is to do these things that aren't necessarily compatible with being substantive. That those same forces are also driving political outcomes. And so that the individuals who are best suited to actually become elected to gain office are maybe least suited to govern yeah, I, I disagree with this. I think people all the time want to blame social media incentives. It's just not the case. I mean, the country's really divided. The current crop of people who are elected are a very accurate reflection of what the populace believes. I don't think it would be all that different, absent Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all of that. And look, I just think that really what it is, is that we have tens of millions of people who are not reconcilable have no faith in the institutional elite, probably shouldn't, in my opinion. And the dramatic failure of our time is that there just does not seem to be any effort to try to forge any coalition whatsoever. Before we go- The primary- Go ahead. Sorry, before, because I want to follow that thread, but I want to bring it back a second because I want to try to pull something out here because Marshall said, well, why don't I just become famous then? You know, why do I want to be a politician? Why don't I just become famous? And that seems to be operative as well. That seemed to have been the case with Trump. I know that the left tried to make Trump out to be some kind of authoritarian, but I always felt like Donald Trump never really cared about power. I never really yeah, felt that he correct. cared about it. Right. It seemed that what he cared he, about was Trump, being famous. I think Trump cares about the aesthetics of power. The aesthetics. This, 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 100%. This, the, I'll, I'll be MSNBC lib and be like, that's the gold toilet seat. That is that part of his personality. So that was actually where I, I scribbled that out before I asked you the initial question, Sagar, which was aesthetics over substance. That we yeah. seem to be living during a time where the incentives- But people want that. That's the thing. I don't think people have internalized this. People don't actually want the quote unquote solution. And I don't think you can fix that. I mean, people want the aesthetics of power. This has generally not been the case up until recently. And I think the reason why is people don't believe that there is an actual fix to the problem. I think it's meta political. That's what I've been saying in terms of what is the fix? And this is what the realignment is all about. I think, you know, if I were to have, say a central critique of left populism, there is no freaking fix to, you know, the child tax credit is a great example. Okay. The child tax credit, we had unconditional cash flow to hundreds of millions of Americans and it had like 48% approval rating. Okay. 48%. It expired yesterday and nobody cares. There's no outcry. People aren't out on the streets. People should really ask themselves, why is that? Because the cash isn't going to fix the fact that people really hate their job or they really hate the way the country feels or they hate the fact they can't go to Thanksgiving and not scream at somebody or they have to wear a mask or they send their kid off. It's all so far upstream of policy solution. And that's why 
I don't have a convenient answer for people. People are like, how do we fix this? I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. See, here's what we do. What we need to do, and I don't want to sound pessimistic. I, I think that Saga Dog could sound cynical sometimes, but we're not trying to be that way. We need to reject the idea of fixes. In most of these cases, I was talking about this. We're doing an episode tomorrow of it's discussing basically like the state of America and whether or not we're in a crisis, civil war, all of the fun Twitter stuff. And what happened was the author of this book, Stephen March, he, he relates the fact that how do I know America's going down? Unlike in the 60s, in the 60s, we were able to pass the civil rights bill. Yeah. Today, we can't do anything big. And my response, and I'll talk about this with him, is, whoa, 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 dude. Like, Think of our political system as like, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Think of it in the sense that, okay, first need. We need, you know, this is libertarian, like minarchist state. We need safety. We need to not get killed in the streets. Up and up and up and up. And what we've seen during the 20th century, social security, getting the TVA set up so the South can be electrified. There are all these basic things that politicians were able to do that not only were passable given the coalitions at the time, but they actually were just like this straightforward fix. We will give you power. That's what you get is very straightforward. And think of the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s. The state doesn't allow black people to vote in the South and makes it difficult in the North. And especially in the South and some parts of the North, black people cannot participate fully in civil society and go to places of business. Okay. In that case, there were these two. I said that in 15 seconds. The issue you were addressing, and I'm not saying it was easy to pass the bill, obviously, not trying to like dunk on LBJ or anything, but the actual approach there is straightforward. But the problem that we face today is that in most of these political cases, take like take racism, like Dimitri, put on your most like center left or just like left hat. Define for me the problem of race in America or 20 seconds or less. You, you actually just can't do it. It's actually super, super, super complicated. People were dunking on Pete Buttigieg for saying that a lot of parts of our infrastructure were institutionally racist. And like, yeah, he's kind of right in the sense that like, hey, like, you know, you've read your Robert Caro in the sense yeah, that like- Yeah, I was just like- well, No, okay, but-, no, but, sure. no, but no, but just listen for a second. This is the key thing. I, I guess actually the fact that we're arguing about it is basically proving the point, which is, yeah, exactly. well, there, but the thing is there was a city planner who literally did design infrastructure in a way that led to disparate racial incomes. This person was a racist. But even in that, this has now gone on for 30, 35 seconds. So like, what exactly mm. is the fix right. there? I mean, actually, frankly, probably the more local you get there's more of a fix, which is an interesting side point, which yeah, is- Yeah, that's right. actually a conversation for the city of New York. Like, this is the whole point, right? Interesting. And yeah, go. This, <laughs> this is why I get so annoyed by all of this. People are like, for example, the central critique of the mean Republican voter today is simple. I feel like nobody respects my point of view in higher society. What do you do? There's no but answer. I, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question ahead. about that. Because yeah. we've both interviewed Michael Lind. Yeah. Now, yes. before I interviewed Michael, I had for years just been talking about this issue in terms of wealth, in terms of the policies right. in American society that clearly were advancing the wealth of those with capital at the expense of those who didn't have it. Mm -hmm. But Michael really exposed me to this idea of power and that really what's at issue here, and I was thinking about this in terms of UBI because he makes the case that you know UBI doesn't really solve the problem because mm -hmm. UBI doesn't change the dynamics of power. It seems to yes. me that whatever it is, whether we're talking about race or whether we're talking about Trump voters, at the heart of that is power. And power is, I think, more poorly distributed in our society today, it seems, than at any point in my lifetime. Could you go into what you mean by So like, for example, I'm just gonna like totally play like CW person. Are you telling me that in the 70s, people had more agency over their lives than today and more ability to affect the system? Because I just don't believe that. I don't believe in 1974 that people, race, color, or creed had power. So I'm just curious uh, what, what, no, I mean, for I, you to define what I you mean. I can't give an answer one way or the other because I wasn't thinking of it in those terms. I was simply thinking of it in the visceral sense of my own life experience. In the course of my life, what has been the arrow? And what I've seen has been... I mean, a ginormous disparity. And I've experienced that in terms of wealth, but I think that wealth comes with power. And it seems that what a lot of people seem to be expressing 
with the various things that they say is that they feel like they don't have the ability to affect their lives in the same way or their politics in the same way. Now, maybe that isn't true, but it seems that that's the perception. I mean, that would be my point of view. Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? What, are, what is your view on that? I'm so excited because I'm fascinated that you set it up that way. Because it's actually it's actually very important what you're describing. You would be a good politician because that was actually a good articulation of what the issue is. The dynamic that's interesting for me, though, and this is why I was focusing on 1974. And once again, the reason why I love doing the realignment the way we do and I love this conversation is it's actually so complicated. And the number one piece of advice I could give you, whether it's mainstream media, whether it's Substack, whether it's podcast, is avoid people who tell you that it is that simple. That's the number one thing I've learned these past few years. Because A, let's talk about power in the 1960s. Let's say you are a populist, conservative Republican. In the 1960s, Donald Trump would not get in 100 miles of the RNC during the national convention. There would have been no primaries. He would have been shot out of those primaries if they'd even like occurred in the traditional way. The delegates, when, if you're a Democrat and you're worried about the super delegates in 2016, look at 1960s, 1950s mm-hmm. America. So literally speaking, Donald Trump would not be able to do anything. Look at the media. I mean, it's easy to dunk on the media. We obviously dunk on the media. There's plenty of things to dunk on. But the media is just so not powerful right now. Like It's easy to say, oh, Don Lemon and make all the very obvious and well-deserved jokes. But Don Lemon just doesn't matter. And he did. And he would have. He Well, frankly, I think that separate. T- I don't need to be rude. But I think he would have mattered much more in the 1950s and 1960s. So what fascinates me, and I have no answer to this. And Sagar, I'm actually curious what you think about this, because I think this is a dichotomy institutions and the powerful have actual less ability at a literal level to dictate what happens. Social media does exist. The political parties aren't that powerful anymore. Media is diffuse. Businesses have like less, brands have just less trust. No one has any trust. Yet people still feel as if they live in a situation almost certainly that's worse than the past. When it's just, I just don't think on an empirical level, I don't think it's true. So I'm interested in the gap between perception and reality. I think the gap is simple. I mean, the truth is, if you were a populist Republican in 1960, you just had, or not even populist Republican, if you were a Republican who was pissed off at the system, you just had a lot more input into the actual system itself. There was more majority. There were the you know Catholic League or whatever that had a meeting with so-and-so. A lot of the cultural excesses and things and the overreach was something that you had a physical ability to go out and check. Labor is actually the exact same way in terms of the power of the labor union. What you have just seen and what you just said is, yeah, on an individual basis, you have more power than you have ever before, but nobody has a higher institution that they feel is empowered enough in order to actually do anything on their behalf. And that's the problem. So, you know, in terms of power for Republicans, like I said, it's a really hard question. They don't actually really care about the solution. For most people, having Trump there was enough. And the reason why is he drove people crazy. And you know, they just feel like they've been spit on for the last 15 years. I think a lot of them have. And I would say that the biggest problem that we have today is a center left that refuses to even understand or realize that they come off as incredibly condescending, off-putting, and awful whenever they're speaking to half the country. If they literally just stop doing that, they would probably win elections. That's actually the Obama story. Obama was a talented enough politician to not make people feel like he absolutely hated their guts. Joe Biden was the natural successor on that. Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg, for a variety of coalitional reasons, are really not capable of doing that even close to the same degree. Bernie, in, back in 2016, I think actually did a pretty decent job, but it's very rare. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, I, I recently saw an ad from Bernie, uh, he's talking about Kellogg workers. And he, you know, he says something like, look, here in America, like we can't have jobs being shipped off to Mexico and you know, these guys getting fired. I'm like, he's literally so old, he still is capable of using that rhetoric. And AOC would not say that today. There's no way. Do you remember that, S- yeah. that SNL skit where he talked about the clapper? I don't. Where I, um, what's his name? The Seinfeld guy. Oh, uh, Larry David. Yeah, Larry David was playing Bernie yeah. Sanders, and he said, uh-huh. he said, why do some people have the clapper and other people don't have the clapper? Oh, he's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like hey, everybody has the clapper or nobody has the clapper. He's yeah, like, why right. can some people, yeah. So 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. There was something to that, though. Oh. It was real. Like, it mattered. Well, know? it says something also, though, that, yeah. and I guess it's always true, but there's something more insightful to me about watching these comedic skits. They reveal a lot about our politics, and some of those SNL skits really were amazing. When I had Andrew Yang on the show, again, you guys had Andrew Yang on the podcast, I asked him about that skit on SNL, where he said, I'm my Yang gang, my Yang, and he shoots up some confetti. Mm -hmm. Something you just said, Sagar, there, and we're going to move it to the overtime, but yeah. I want to make sure I clarify it to make sure that I understood it correctly. Is what you're saying that there's less sort of diversity and health in the political coalitions in American society today? Yes. Okay, good. Because that kind of speaks- not, And, and, and uh, here's the key. It's not just political. It's cultural. And I think that the fusion of the two is just so key for people to understand. Like the culture is- unambiguously left of about 75% of the entire country. About 25% are willing to live with it and don't care enough to do anything about it. And the rest are annoyed on varying degrees, sometimes annoyed enough to vote for Trump, sometimes annoyed, but willing to vote for Biden. There were a lot of those people in the year 2020. But if you adopt that framework and you understand that, you see too why it feels like there's no fix to a lot of these politics today. I just want to add one thing real quick, which is what you just said, Sagar, is an interesting yeah. issue for Democratic politicians, though, because like, look at the story. So I get your point about how right now the party, you know, probably like the culture is to the left of where the median voter is. But someone I want to bring on the realignment soon is this person named Sasha Eisenberg, who wrote a book about the 25 years where gay marriage went from just being a total like out of control anathema to just being the thing where it's a total consensus. So the thing that's interesting here, and this is where Democrats are stuck in a trap and why the 2010s were a trap, which was, sorry, you could have said exactly what you just said to Democrats in 2008, yet they were able through, let's just say some degree of hiding positions and advancing slowly but surely to move the country to their side on gay marriage and like a lot of LGBTQ issues. What's interesting though, is I think what happened during the Trump era is that under everyone just losing their minds, I think in many cases deservedly so because of Trump, the Democrats overshot where they could actually move people on. I am sorry, there is just a difference between defund the police and gay marriage. And so many Democratic activists, especially younger ones, saw the Democratic Party move people on gay marriage, I think rightfully so, and have extrapolated it to apply to other social issues as well. Let me just point you right back to what you said previously. Gays couldn't get married, and now they can. It's a simple fix. It's like the civil rights thing. Defund the police. Oh, systemic. This shit is incomprehensible. And beyond that, there's no actual fix. What are you saying? What do you actually want to do? And by the way, when you start to answer those questions, it's crazy. Whenever you start to read what Ibrahim Kendi wants, what, some like amendment to the Constitution for a department of anti-racism, go ahead and poll it. Be my guest. This is exactly what I'm talking about, which is that the current set of issues that they believe are the most pressing or whatever is just simply not shared whatsoever with the American people. And unlike the gay marriage example, they don't have the quick and dirty, easy fix in order to try and move people towards it. And, you know, flagellating children by making them grade each other by the color of their skin or, I mean, you know, any number of the current number of examples, sports, these are another good example. I mean, it's not going to happen. It's just simply not the same whatsoever. And I don't think that enough of these people are able to disaggregate and think, here's a good counter, Marshall. Abortion hasn't moved at all in the same 10 years that gay marriage did. Not once. If anything, it's probably moved a little bit more in the pro-life direction. It is still a true 50-50. That's it. I mean, you could say, oh, not enough time or whatever. I would say on that one, well, it ain't as simple, is it? It's still really complicated. And whenever that's the answer on these things, I think you're still going to fall into the current paradigm that we operate in. So guys, I want to move the rest of our conversation into the overtime. And I want to stay sure. on this sort of thread we're hovering around or sort of focusing in on what it is that I think matters here. Just to sort of my take before we move to the overtime, I think part of what's happening here is there's a kind of a breakdown in belief systems. And I think that 
this has been in no small part driven by the type of disillusionment that has been born from lie followed by failure followed by lie. I think that America has become a more corrupt society. That, that word itself, it's difficult to really, we, we could try and define it, but it feels more corrupt. And in some ways, you know, I've tried so hard to understand this and it's so hard. There's actually a great quote that guys that I put at the very top of your rundown for this episode, which is a quote by Edward R. Murrow that I absolutely love. And the quote is, anyone who isn't confused doesn't really understand the situation. And I feel like this is where we are today. I've been confused for years trying to understand this. I think social media does play a role, but to your point, Sagar, I don't think it explains everything. I've looked towards the Soviet Union and the collapse of the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Russia as a, an additional sort of data point or series of data points that helps provide an explanation. Because I think, and to that point, I think what we might be living through is some form of collapse without sort hmm. of understanding it, because maybe in our minds, a collapse looks a particular way. It's a building collapsing or it's this sudden thing, but maybe it doesn't actually have to be that way. And I feel like we share some of that nihilism. I mean, the US in the 90s shared some of that. There was that kind of thread of nihilism. There was a kind of paranoia that has resurfaced today as well. And I think that it was pronounced in the Soviet Union in particular because you had this system of belief that was suddenly shattered. And all of a sudden you had a kind of new system and everyone just changed their shirts, but everyone just had to continue to pretend that what just happened didn't happen in a way. And also something that my old Soviet professor taught me in college that stuck with me was that the central grievance in, in, in post-Soviet politics has been the way in which the wealth of the Soviet Union was plundered and reallocated to the oligarchs. And I think, again, that speaks to something that's true in American politics, which is that we all saw what happened in 2008. We can't erase that from our memory, but we had to pretend that it didn't happen. And as much as we liked Barack Obama, and we did, and he was such a charismatic president, he presided over that period. And so there's a kind of, I think, disillusionment in American society. There's distrust. Again, to quote a guest that likely been on your podcast as well, David Shore. David Shore also mm -hmm. helped me think about this, this divide being trust. Those who yes. fundamentally trust the existing power structure in American society and those who distrust it. And I think we see that now in this COVID moment with vaccines, right? And this brings us to a larger conversation, which I want to have. Again, we're going to have it in the overtime, but I want to tease one more thing because I think it's fascinating. I know both of you have thought about it, and that is what Joe Rogan is as an entity, as an individual, not just what he represents, but what he truly is in this you know, fragmented media landscape. The fact that he is by far the most popular voice in media and why it is that people gravitate towards him. What can we infer about the body politic, the zeitgeist in American society? And not just American society, he's popular in the Western world. He's a popular guy. You go to other countries, they know who Joe Rogan is. You know, it's funny. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And the answer is a lot more simple. People try and ascribe all sorts of things. Here's the answer. Okay, I want you to save it for the overtime. Yeah. We're going to move that to the okay, overtime because right, I want to hear what you have to say, Saga. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Marshall and Sagar, as well as the transcripts and rundowns to this episode and every other episode we've ever done, head over to hiddenforces.io and check out our episode library or subscribe directly through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hiddenforces. There's also a link in the summary page to this episode with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so that you can listen to these extra discussions just like you listen to the regular podcast. Guys, stick around. We're going to move the second half of our conversation into the subscriber overtime. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. 
As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.